for the garden, right? They didn't take that thought. I want to be like God. He's holding out on me. They failed to take that thought captive and they chose to sin. We don't want to think that we still have this choice thing. I do things because I can't help myself. I, I said that for a long time. It's just how I am. I told my wife a lot of things that I did. You know, that's just how I am. Just, just deal with it. It's not true. It's not how I am. It's the choices that I've made that make me behave that way. To think that way. The thoughts that I have come into an agreement with that make me act that way. Good or bad. It works both sides. The system is the same whether we agree with it or not. If everything, good thoughts that we have, we have positive outcomes. It's a choice. Sometimes we think we can, God, just don't give me choices. Just do it. Just do it. And then we complain. It doesn't look like how I want it to look. See, we, that's, when we talk about this revolution, that's the changing of our minds. We, have to, we need a thought revolution. We need to understand that we can no longer think like the world thinks. This week, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about education. And if you haven't figured this out, I've kind of been going through the different mountains of our society over the last four or five weeks of re dealing with this revolution that we, we have to bring the change. We have to impose God's kingdom into this realm. It doesn't just happen. We are the change agents. That's why he said, go and make disciples of nations. Bring my kingdom and, and bring that transforming power of salvation into this realm. It's a revolution. It goes against what all creation has been under the curse of sin and death. And so when I think about this, you know, we have to think differently. I've been talking, I've been, I've been just, he's just, just been talking to me about this education, about this mountain of education. It's a, and, and how big is the mountain of education? Do you realize education impacts every aspect of our lives? Every aspect of it. It's not just junior high and high school and elementary school. That's, that's not... It impacts and shapes our lives. Everything that we do is impacted by the education that we have. Positively or negatively. So when we're talking about... Oops, turn out. When we're talking about this revolution of God's kingdom, I know we've been talking about... You know, Jesus was... I think it was revolutionary. He was trying to right-side the world, to be quite honest. The world was, was upside down because it was backwards. It was sin infested. And so he came to bring a revolution. He's not counterculture. He is the culture. It was, that was the intent. It was him, you know, when, when God created us to be, you know, one with him in the garden to make the earth look like heaven. That was the intent. So when Jesus came to set things properly, he's not countercultural. He's not a socialist. It's not everybody has the same. He's a kingdom understanding. We... Our desire still, in, in, even in this nation, is, oh, we want everybody to be equal. It's not a kingdom. We're not all equal. We have different gifts. We have different aspects. We are set apart differently. How can we all be kings and priests? We are. Because we have different gifts. It doesn't make one better than another. See, that's the comparison. Satan wants us to compare. To create animosity against one another when we should be about helping one another, about being interested in everything of what God is doing in our lives, in the nation. It's not competition. Jesus was, wouldn't be a Republican or a Democrat. No political party has Jesus on the shelf. He's not their spokesperson. Even though we might act like we do. Oh, if, you know, we're the righteous, you know, political party. There isn't one. He's about God's kingdom. Every political party is about their own kingdom. Jesus would be about his father's kingdom. And so this revolution that we're talking about, there's three aspects to any revolution. Any changing takes a motivation. You have to have a desire to change. Otherwise, complacency will keep you where you are. We have to have a desire to change. To, to grasp salvation, we had to renounce where we were, that we needed a Savior. Otherwise, we would stay where? In sin and death. 
We had, there had to be some motivation. And what that does is that, that magnetism, there is a desire, there is a heartfelt desire to change, to see a benefit of, of, of what that entails. And that leads to mobilization, to action. Same principles are the gospel. When we present the gospel, what are we doing? We are presenting them to motivate them to, to grasp who Jesus Christ is. To have an understanding of that heart and transforming power of that spirit within us. And to say yes to revolution. Every soul saved is a revolution. It takes one from darkness to light. That's what we're to be about. We need revolutions. I'm not talking about communist revolutions or... I'm talking about the revolution that we that transforms this world from darkness to light. So this week I want to talk about education. Because education, like I said, it impacts every area of our lives. We think, well, I don't have kids. Don't have to worry about education. Well, do you have grandkids? Do you have family members with kids? Were you a kid at one point? Were you all in some kind of an educational format? Because I'm going to take just a... I'm just going to run a little here and say everybody went to school. Whether that was homeschool, whether that was high school, college, what, I'm going to take it. Anybody that didn't go to school? Okay. We all are a product of education. And that education impacts every area of our lives. Whether we, are, whether we realize it or not, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today, is understanding what education does this nation provide? What are we impacting? How does education impact the next generation? Because some of us have gray hair, a little older, my kids are, are stepping out into the world now, and that's the generation that's coming up. And what have they learned? What have they been instilled with? What's the next 20 years going to look like? Because the last 40 years since I've been on this planet, I haven't seen a whole lot of change and, sh and shift into a kingdom of God. Darkness has been advancing. I mean, look at our lifestyles, marriage, genders, just the, the erosion of the family. All those things that we've talked about, you know, between even the church, the church has eroded over the last years. Pandemic showed us how essential the church became, or non-essential. So when I talk about education, what's the basis of education? Why is it important? Why, like, why, why, is, why is that a, a need? We all have to be educated. But also, who's responsible for education? I want to hit those first two, because they go together. Because we have to understand the whole purpose of education is, is to have people grow into maturity, is it not? So when we talk about education and what is the basis of it, that's really what I want to focus on first. And it says in, the, in Proverbs 1.7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Because isn't education, we're after knowledge. Right? That's why we educate our kids. That's why we, we send them to school, to gain knowledge, to gain the ability to do math and science and all of these things. So we have a purpose of education, but Proverbs strictly states that it is the fear of the Lord that begins knowledge. So without the fear of the Lord, where is knowledge? It's foolishness. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 8 says this, Hear my son, your father's instructions, and, not, and forsake not your mother's teaching. So where's the responsibility? Who's responsible for this instruction and teaching and education? I believe it says fathers and mothers. I don't read the state. U.S. government. I don't, I don't see that. Deuteronomy goes on even further to say this. In these words, I command you. God, people say, oh, that's Old Testament. God's commands are forever. We're under the grace of of the new covenant, but his commands never cease. He says, I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. 
and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk in the, by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Who's teaching? Father and mother. We have to understand this is a command. Who is teaching? You shall teach them. We said, here, state, teach my kid. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Who's doing the training? Who's doing this training? It's the parents. We have to understand that. I think the parents, we, we've gotten caught up in this world of, well, I have to make a living, so I have to go work, and I can't, we have to have two incomes because we have to, we can't survive, and so our kids are shoved into daycare from day, from six months, maybe, if that long, and the state has them the rest of their educational formative years, and we wonder why they look that way. I don't know why my son doesn't want to come to church anymore. I don't know why. Ephesians 6, four says, fathers. Again, why do you think, last week we were talking about families, fathers have been under attack in this nation since probably the last 50 years, horribly, breaking the family unit. We have more single parent mothers than we've ever had. Why? Because fathers have been under attack. That is the still God-ordained authority of a family unit, and it's their responsibility to train children. Not just the children. I love this verse. When you read this verse, as his father's not provoke your children anger, but, and I use this, bring them up. I'm going to talk about that verb right there. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Do you realize that's the same verb that he uses in 529? It's ectere pho. Don't, don't judge my, my Greek. But Paul uses the same this same verb, he says it's for the fathers to bring them up, their children, is also in Ephesians 5.29 when he commands husbands to nourish their wives as their own bodies. Again, the responsibility of fathers has been, we, we just created this thing where, where fathers just come and go. There's a responsibility. If we are training our kids, if I'm not training my son to understand what fatherhood looks like, Who's going to teach him? Is the state? Is the media, the shows, the TV that we watch? That's how they're learning what a father looks like. And when you look at those shows, they're idiots. That's what, I mean, we laugh about it, but you look at any television show today, the father, idiot. Non-essential, the mother runs the thing, and usually the kids actually run everything. <clears throat> Yeah, the daughters are... The sons kind of fall in the same category as the father. But you look at, I mean, look at the television shows of today. That's, that's what they're... And this is what is shaping our youth because the fathers aren't there. And if the mothers are, they're single moms. And where are they? They're working. Where are the kids? It's the same verb. And I love that because husbands and fathers therefore have a special... A special responsibility to oversee the educative environment of their houses. What are men talking about? Hey, how's my golf game? How's my buddies? Can we go to the bar? Don't care about the kids. We have to understand fathers have to be trained. And how do we train them? With their children. At training them up in the way that they should go. If we neglect that, what kind of father are we going to have? We get the absentee fathers. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, so if we have an understanding of what, what are we teaching, what's the basis of our instruction, it is to be the Word of God. It says that it's all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. If it's not based on the Word, what are we teaching and what are we looking to grow? Secularism. Humanism. We're going to talk about some of those isms today. Because that's where we are. We've allowed this to happen. 
I mean, like I said, I think last week, the Bible wasn't, it was not legislated to be in the classroom as a teaching tool in the, in the 1700s, 1800s. It was there because it was used as the teaching tool. It was desired to be there. They prayed in class because they wanted it. They desired it. There was no legal, you know, act of Congress to bring prayer or Bible into a school. But we had acts of Congress now to kick them out. So the Bible is the key to all understanding. The Holy Spirit is well, the Spirit of truth. Anything based outside of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is going to be of this world. And what do we expect people to learn if we've removed this from our education system? If we remove God from everything within our government and in our state schools, what do we expect? Because voids are not allowed. You've got to understand something. Why did Jesus use an admonition that if they reject it, they cast out these demons and they swept it clean? Okay? Seven more will come back if you do not fill that spot. So as we had ousted God out of our schools and out of our government, out of our society, what has come in? The spirit of Antichrist. Humanism. Secularism. That's, those are religions. Those are gods and people that, that God is man now. Everything is based on us because we've removed God. But you look at our founders, did they think that when they set up this, this nation? I don't know. That bad man, Benjamin Franklin, he talks about the Bible. The Bible is the foundational of all education and development. He's a pretty smart guy. The greatest education is the knowledge of God. Do you think that's being taught in our schools today? How about Theodore Roosevelt, the president? A thorough knowledge of the Bible is worth more than a college education. Maybe I should just keep my son home and just teach him the Bible and see him on the UCI. I don't think he wants to do that. Computer science engineering, I'm, I'm okay with him though. But, so, again, we have to understand the desire for knowledge and understanding has to be biblically based. Otherwise, our kids are going to learn, we are going to learn another, another God, another way, which is of this world. And that is why it's an Antichrist spirit. See, it's not just in Revelation that we read about the Antichrist spirit. That Antichrist spirit has been here since day one. Anything that goes against the knowledge of Jesus Christ is an anti-Christ spirit. So what's in our schools today? Well, let's think about what's the purpose of education. And again, for by show of hands, who went to public school? I went to public school. We're all, most, with the exception of at least a couple I know of, are a product of public education. And the purpose of public education, when it was founded, when it was founded, as public education first came to foothold in America in the, in the 30s, the goal of such education was to create a literate and productive citizenry with a common system of morals. That was the purpose. What was the purpose of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring salvation? What did religion do? We created worlds by which we govern people. Education started with a purpose. Because you have a new, a new country that's being formed. We need to educate them. We need to help them to become productive citizens that understand the, the dynamic of this nation. But it also had a moral character to it. But what's happened in our, world, in, our, in our system since then, I use this for us that grew up in the 80s and early 90s, Giggo was what we called it. It's garbage in and garbage out. What are we putting into our education system? What are we going to get out? If we have removed the Bible and the, and the truth of, of God and who He is and the transforming power and what moral standards are, we put garbage in, we're going to get garbage out. How the horse man is credited with starting public school in America. 
Government-run education in the United States is in 1939, 1839. He learned the techniques from Prussia. His motivation was to end education by Christians. Do you realize up until that point, all of the schools that we had, all the colleges were actually seminaries? Harvard, Princeton, Yale. They were seminaries. All the education was based on a Christian moral foundation. But they wanted to take God out of the government, and you had to do that by educating people. They knew this. This is why it's an antichrist spirit. You have to remove God. Horace Mann was a Unitarian. They don't believe in that. I mean, Unitarian is not even a, a religion, to be quite honest. Basically, it's a secular religion. It's humanist. It says that there's no inspiration in the Bible, there's no trinity. This is who started. And he had a purpose. Horace Mann wrote in 1942. Our common schools reach, with more or less directness and intensity, all children belonging to the state. Children who are soon to be the state. This is the founder of public school. He's saying our reach is for all the kids to get the kids to belong that belong to the state so they become the state. Is there indoctrination here? This is the this is 1839. He goes 49. He goes on to say this. And it sounds really good. A republic, in a republic, ignorance is a crime. And what did we do? We instituted mandates so that kids had to go to public school. I had to go. I couldn't stay home. I mean, I cut class a couple times, but, you know, I didn't get caught very much. But we have to go. There is a mandate. It became they passed laws that said they have to go. So no longer was that just a, you know, metaphor. It became real. And so who follows up? Our buddy John Dewey. The Dewey Decimal System. Isn't that awesome to go in a library? This guy was a humanist. He came on the, on the scene in, in the early 20, 1920s and 30s and he established the principles that Horace Mann had put in place and the concept of humanistic education as a religion. But yet, schools say there is a separation of church and state. We don't allow religion to influence our school's education, but yet, humanism, it's a religion. It has belief structures. I'll talk about that in a minute. Dewey was president of the American Humanist Association. This is the guy that's helping design our schools. Why do they look the way they look? I'm starting to kind of understand. I hope, I hope you're seeing that now. He's the signer of the first Humanist Manifesto. I've got some excerpts from a couple of them. There's actually been three of them over about 80 years. But in the 1930s, they had this Humanist Manifesto of what they believe in. Not that it's a religion, no. He saw Christianity as a huge problem that needed to be solved. How do we get religion? How do we get, no, it's Christianity. It's not, they weren't worried about the Muslim impact. They weren't even worried about the Jewish impact. This was a God-based Christianity. How do we get it out of this education system? Because if we can get it out, then we can indoctrinate what we want. It was secularism. See, modern public education serves now. This is off their own website. Department of Education. I got this off their website. Modern public education serves to develop an informed and productive workforce through a system that allows for social mobility. Studies show that free. How is our education free? Do you pay taxes? Oh, so wait, our government says it's free. Oh, it's free to them because they don't actually pay it. We do. Universal education for children in grades K through 12 can be the greatest factor in addressing inequality in society. So when did education become about inequality or equity? Today it's about equity. We want equity of outcome. 
We want everybody to be the same. This is not, this is old. This is, this is their mandate. It's not like we just came up with this since we got woke. This has been on their website so they understand that it's about inequality in society. So what are they teaching? Well, let's take a quick look. I got these off the, off the internet. It says, Washington high school students no longer required to pass statewide test to get a diploma. They don't have to be able to pass a required test in English, language arts, mathematics, or graduate with a high school diploma. Organ, weather, science, and their ending, reading, and math proficiency requirements for graduation. Why? Because it wasn't equitable. People of color didn't, they weren't, they weren't being treated the same way. They did this because of the diversion. People, the diverse population wasn't being treated the same way. So we took away the standards for graduation. What does that have to do with understanding how to read and write? The color of my skin does not impact that. The equity of the outcome has to be different because it's effort. We're trying to legislate equality through equity, meaning we want the same outcome for everybody, and it's not possible. It takes away the desire to excel. So what are we, what, what are we teaching? Well, if you, if you believe what, what the humanists are telling us, this evolution of humanism, it's the denial of any power and moral value superior to that of humanity, the rejection of religion in favor of a belief and the advancement of humanity by its own efforts. We've used evolution to remove God. Evolution was the first step. The theory of evolution is not even a theory anymore. They just present the principles of evolution now. Have we ever been able to prove evolution to be true? No. But that evolution removed God from this, this equation. And now... Our education system is about how well can, we, that's why equity works now. How well we want you to do. It's about you, about your excellence. Whatever's good for you is good for you. We don't want those tests to demonstrate how well you do. Those, those must be biased. But this is why evolution has changed. Evolution came in to usher in humanism. If we got God out of the equation, out of creation, then guess what? We are our own salvation. And that's what humanism teaches. And that's what we're being taught in schools. Humanistic educators are opposed to the objective tests because they test the student's ability to memorize and do not provide sufficient educational feedback to the teacher and student. The aims of education is cultivation of the intellect. Education is an inclusive concept and not mere schooling. Does this sound familiar? Liberation of the mind, human perfection. The self-actualization is where we're at. Happiness and material abundance, welfare, wait for it, of the total humanity. Everything's inclusive. This one world, one government, one people, one community. Humanism and education is focused on humans' ability. Did we not just say that, that the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but yet we focus on our ability? Understand the universe and how it works. Why do you think they had to go through evolution to be able to explain to us how the, the universe works without God? to remove any theist belief. Logic, grammar, astrology, music, poetry, rhetoric, literature. What happened to reading, writing, and arithmetic? What about those things that built us into a nation that knew how to function? I love this little cartoon talking about how the humanists see their classrooms. It says, Promoting cooperative learning and small group learning instead, oh, we don't like this, competitive large group learning. We don't want to be competitive. 
Everybody gets a trophy. That's really what we've come down to. Anybody that spends four years coming to our high school, we're going to give them a diploma. Everybody gets a trophy. What does that trophy mean? What does that diploma mean now? No, now they have to go to college and spend another four years. The government will wipe off your loans. It's okay. But now you have to go to college because everybody should go to college. But they just keep passing people along. Where's the education and understanding coming from? This religion of humanism is the Antichrist spirit. It absolutely is an Antichrist spirit. And when you look at the definition of humanism as a noun, it's, it's an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanists believe, believe stress the potential value and goodness of human beings emphasize common human needs and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. Man, that sounds good. That's just, I love that. With the exception that, you know, it's not up to God. If we have nothing to do with Him, it's all about us. We are our own Savior. That's the core value of the humanist. But that's what we're in the school. It's about us. What's good for you. They believe that there is a goodness, an inherent core goodness of man, of a human, woman or man, doesn't matter. But yet, God says, what? None? None are righteous? Not one? So this is a belief system. And when I was talking about that, that manifesto, the, the Humanist Manifesto, a couple of points I want to just highlight for you. There were about 20 or 30 of them, but I just want to highlight a couple of them. Because this is how we start to see how our education system has infiltrated not just the education, but it goes into media, into our government, into every aspect of our lives. This is how we become a godless nation. Their first bullet point, in the best sense, and I love this, it's a nod to religion, in the best sense, religion may inspire dedication to the higher ethical ideals, may, the cultivation of moral devotion and creative imagination is an expression of genuine spiritual experience and aspiration. We believe, however, that traditional dogmatic or authoritarian religions that place revelation, God, ritual, or creed above human needs and experiences do a disservice to the human species. So right off the bat, they're saying, oh, religion's okay. We don't need it. It does a disservice. Those dogmatic things, they're trying to impress upon us these rules and regulations that are oppressive. They hold us down. They don't let us be the, the self-actualized humans that we were created to be. We weren't created. That we evolved to be. Sorry, we weren't created. Thank you. We evolved to be. Their second point is this. Promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusory and harmful. They distract humans from present concerns, from self-actualization, and from rectifying social injustices. Yeah, that heaven and hell thing, that's a problem. It's really oppressive. It, it distracts us. Do you think Satan would want to distract us from heaven and hell? Eh, probably not, right? He's, 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 he's all good. It, it takes us away from our self-actualization. That's in the Bible, right? That's a, that's a biblical, that's something we strive for. That's what Jesus said. Become more like you. And we wonder why our education system and our governments and our society looks godless. We affirm, point three, that moral values derive their source from human experience. What does that mean? It's situational. We 
today get to decide what's moral. Well, this is good. No, that's bad. Tomorrow, this is good, and that's bad. It's situational. It's ex we have to experience it. Well, that's bad for society. Ethics is autonomous. I get to have my own ethics. You can have your own too. That's what we're teaching today. If it's good for you, you do it. Don't, don't tell me it's bad because that would hurt me. I don't want to hear the truth. That's your truth. Don't put your truth upon me. Don't put your dogmatic, authoritarian doctrine upon me. This is what we're up against. It says it's situational, meaning no theological or ideological sanction. We get to do it ourselves. Is this not what Satan offered in the garden? Is this not what he said? You can be just like God. Romans 3.10 happens to say that none is righteous, not one. Romans 3.23 says, For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we're going to strike because don't judge me. I can be just like God. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a very way it seems right to man, but it is the way of death. This is what we're teaching. It's totally contrary. That's why I call this humanism the Antichrist spirit. And it's a religion. They're teaching a religion. They're teaching a belief structure. But yet we have separation of church and state. How about point six? I'm not going to go through them all. I'm just going to hit it. In the area of sexuality, this is interesting. We believe that intolerant, intolerant attitudes often cultivated by orthodox religions and puritanical cultures unduly repress sexual conduct. The right of birth control, abortion, and divorce should be recognized. This is what we're teaching in our schools. If you think you're a woman, you get to be a woman. If I want to have sex, I can have sex with whatever I want. Because it's about me. It's my desire to be self-actualized. Abortions are good. I, I need to have that ability to have an abortion. I need to be able to have sex with whoever and wherever and whenever I want. Don't judge me. I can divorce anytime I feel like it. I mean, I read this article about some of the, uh, a, I, I looked at it, it was a humanist uh, wedding vows. If we choose to be together, we can be together. There's no commitment. There's no, again, commitments are oppressive. We don't need those. We don't want to be under, under rules. Under laws? No. We want to have, I want to be able to define them myself. Point nine says the separation of church and state and the separation of ideology and state are imperatives. They just don't call themselves a church. They're a religion. It's imperative. Why? You got it. It's not about keeping the Jewish faith out of schools or the Muslims. It's about keeping the Christian faith out of schools. It's about Jesus Christ. I can walk into any school and, and pray in the name of Allah and have no problem. You speak the name of Jesus and they're going to kick me out. That's changing, thank God. We can pray in schools. We always have. We always have that ability. We just want to step up and do it now. Our kids have to know they can pray in school. They've always been able to. We just believe what we're told. Oh, no, there's a separation. You can't do that here. You can't pray here. You have one or two teachers say, no, you can't do that. Oh, we can't do that. All right. We have to understand there is no separation of church and state. We talked about that. One of the last ones I want to talk about today is this world community. And this is where you really start to see this antichrist spirit. Their 12th point, again, they have about 20 or so, 25 of them, says, we deplore the division of humankind on nationalistic grounds. Why do you think we have open borders? Why do you think we have the UN? Why do you think we want to be just one global community? We have reached a turning point in human history 
where the best option is to transcend the limits of national sovereignty and to move toward the building of a world community in which all sectors of the human family can participate. Thus, we look to the development of a system of world law and a world order based upon transformational federal government. I think that's called Antichrist. One world government. One control. We got to get rid of this nationalism. We need to be one people. We got to help people because people are being oppressed because of this nationalism. One of the things that their, their points are is they're, they're very big about democratic process. Oh, we're all about the democratic process. Do you realize the democratic process is what? The majority rules. They will rule so the majority, the many, can oppress the few or to conform the few. Do you know where that leads? It's called a holocaust. You take a majority that can inflict their will upon a minority, that's called slavery. That's what the Antichrist does. Slavery from the pit of hell was a few being oppressed by many. Because why? It was the law of the land. The Holocaust saw the same thing. It was the law of the land. Plain out democracy is not the savior of the world. That is not freedom. That is, that is the, the majority rule. That's why we are a democratic republic. To thwart that. That's why a jury, if it was just, think about if you had to go in front of a jury and it was a majority rule. So the life and death of an individual is placed upon what? If I can get seven out of twelve. I can be free, or I can go to death. I can go to the, the, the lethal injection. That's pretty scary. Why do you think they had what? They had posses that would go out and, and, and grab people and, and lynch them. Because why? That's mob rule. That is majority rule. It wasn't bringing it back to let the sheriff and have a judge and a jury decide. The majority starts to dictate what happens to the minority. And it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. But it sounds so good. So that everybody can participate as long as it's under the allegiance, the oligarchy that runs everything. That's a whole other, whole other issue. All right, I'm wrapping this thing up. I love this. It shows this great family. I think it looks like two guys and two girls, but I can't help that. It says, as humanists, we promote the building of an inclusive society that allows everyone to live in dignity. I mean, this sounds so good. Without, without fear of discrimination on any ground. That's a slippery slope. They even have their ten commitments. It's not a religion, though. The Ten Commitments of Living of Humanist Values. I mean, they sound so good. Responsibility, empathy, critical thinking. All of these are just like, what, the Ten Commandments? No, these are the Ten Commitments. There's two trees. One tree is a tree of knowledge of good and evil, and one is the tree of life. You can see that there was... We glorify God. When we desire that His Word lead and guide us, we glorify Him. We have the Scriptures. We, we understand the creation of Deism. But, you know, this, this, this whole thing of, of, of humanism, if you read this text, and I'm not going to read all of it from, from Romans 1, 18 to 32, almost every one of their points in the Humanist Manifesto is debunked by what God's Word says. It is truly the antithesis of what his word says. That's why it is an antichrist spirit. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. 
They're suppressing the truth because they, if they can deny God, all things are possible. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. He doesn't exist. It's easy. We don't have to honor Him. Or give thanks, but they became futile in their, own, in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Skip down to verse 26. It says, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the, and of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and perceiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a deprived mind to do those things which are not proper. This is where our society is. This is where our education system is. And it impacts all of our lives. Colossians 2.8 says this. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Are we protecting our kids? Are we products of this same philosophy? I had to unlearn a lot of things. When I came out of college, I said, I mean, my wife will tell you this. There's many ways to God. It can't be just one way to heaven. No, we just have to be good. We just have to try our best. I came out as a humanist. I didn't go in as one. But I had to, I was indoctrinated and didn't even realize it. I fell victim to that philosophy. Our prayer is to give our kids that foundation to be able to go to school and still get educated without being indoctrinated. That's a tough standard because think about this. Our kids, kids in, in, from K to 12, every week, for 180 days, every week, 52.7 hours a week, they are in school, doing school, or in transportation to and from school. 53 hours a week on average, and we think an hour in Bible school, you know, Sunday school is going to fix everything. The indoctrination is real. It's a matter of us. How do we combat this? We have to train them up. Whether you're a grandparent, uncle, aunt, I don't care. We have to be engaged. It's up to us. We can't allow them to be captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the eternal spirit of this world, of the world, and not according to Christ. We wonder why our kids look the way they look. Humanism. And when I bring this back to conclusion with understanding it is the Antichrist spirit, it is prolific in this world, and it continues to infiltrate every mountain of our society. This exaltation of man is the force which we finally give rise to the Antichrist, whose name is the number of man from Revelation 13, 18. The man of, of lawlessness. Lawlessness. Think about what those... Every precept of the humanist was what there is no right or wrong. It is truly within ourselves to define our own true laws, right? And the law that is lawlessness, who opposes and exalts himself above everything that is called God. All it does is say there is no God. All it is, you're your own God. You're the best God there is. Make yourself the best you can be. That's all that matters. For today we live, tomorrow we die. Who cares? Don't worry about heaven and hell. That's, that's, that's dogmatic. We don't, we don't have to worry about that. Even sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. That's what Antichrist spirit is. I'm gonna, I, 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 I found this, I, I think I got this off the internet. A secular person says, I want to do X. Christian says, you're free to do it. Secular person says, but you think X is wrong. Christian says, yes. Secular person says, because you want to control me. Christian says, no, you're free to do whatever you wish. Secular person says, but you think X is wrong. Yes, but only because I want what's best for you. Secular person says, but I want to do X. Christian says, you're free to do it. 
It's like a person says, but I want you to say that X is good. But I can't. It's like the person, why are you such a hateful, intolerant bigot? Isn't that what we have today? They want to hear out of your mouth what they're doing is okay. That's what the whole transgender and homosexual thing is. Tell me it's okay. They want you to tell them what they're doing is okay. And if you don't, you are intolerant. You are a bigot. You're a racist. Now we've got the white supremacist national Christians that were the worst because we want dominion. We have to understand this is what we're up against. This is what our kids are up against. So we need a revolution in our education system. And you know what? We're coming up in a season where there are 81,000 school board seats up for election this fall. Most of them are, are settled in the primary. So when, when Marie was talking about voting for the primaries and the, and the school boards, most of them are settled in the primaries because a lot of them will be only one party running. 81,000. If we were to get half of those believers, we could transform the school systems around this nation. But we have to do it. We have to take action. We can no longer just sit back and allow this humanist, antichrist spirit to continue to, to just permeate our education systems. It's up to us. We're the ones that have the kids. We're the ones that pay for them to go to school. It's not free. It's still our tax dollars. The largest percentage of your property taxes goes where? Education. This is who we have to be. This is the revelation. The revolution. That we have to be a part of. Even if it's a small aspect of just voting righteously for school board members. Going to school board meetings and hearing what they do. Holding teachers accountable when you have a nephew or a niece or a granddaughter that comes home and says, Oh, look at this. We've got two James in our class now. We're learning about two, two daddies. We have to step into that role and train them up in the way that they should go. Otherwise, they will depart. We don't want to think about it, but that's where we are right now. This is critical because right now this education system is producing tomorrow's leaders. These kids right here, they're tomorrow's leaders. How are we training them up? What are we allowing? Because what we allow, they will accept as real next. The next generation is accepted. Whatever we allow, they'll take as true. It's up to us. Stay with me, if you would, please. 